Welcome to The How of Business with your host, Henry Lopez, the podcast that helps you start, run, and grow your small business. And now, here is your host. This is Henry Lopez. Welcome to this episode of The How of Business. My guest today is Stephen Pope. Stephen, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. Looking forward to this. This is a topic we haven't covered in a while and and only very, very uh, briefly. So today we're going to chat about Stephen's journey, how he got to where he is today as an entrepreneur, how he became an expert on all things Amazon, and an introduction is what I'm hoping to to get from Stephen. He has an incredible amount of knowledge and shares an incredible amount of information on his different platforms on how to sell products on Amazon. So that's what we're going to dive into today. If you want to receive more information about the How of Business, including the show notes page for this episode, and also to schedule a free coaching consultation with me, just visit thehowofbusiness.com. So let me tell you more about Stephen. Stephen Pope is the founder of My Amazon Guy. My Amazon Guy is a full-service Amazon agency that helps their clients growth hack sales through traffic and conversion improvements, including PPC, SEO, design, catalog merchandising, and more. And they do it all in-house. And you can learn all about all of his offerings on his website, on his YouTube channel, and he also has a podcast, and you can find that all under My Amazon Guy. Stephen started his career as a uh, TV reporter in Idaho. Then he was an e-commerce director for 10 years for brands ranging from gold and silver coins to women's plus size clothing. And after uh, dozens of requests to consult for Amazon clients, other people who were interested in, in getting his knowledge, he started My Amazon Guy to make it easier to growth hack that platform. Stephen owns MAG. Is it M-A-G? What, what does MAG stand for? I should have asked you that. My Amazon Guy. Ah, that's the acronym for My Amazon Guy. I should have known that. <laughs> that's all right. He, he also owns My Refund Guy, which is a clawback FBA, which FBA stands for Fulfillment by Amazon, uh, a clawback FBA service, and Momster, a private label FBA wine glass brand. He has more than 675 plus tutorial videos on his YouTube YouTube channel uh, showing you how to handle any problem faced on Amazon. And Stephen, as I mentioned, also hosts a podcast with interviews from other Amazon experts. Stephen lives in uh, outside of Atlanta in the Duluth, Georgia area. So once again, Stephen Pope, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Henry. Yeah, looking forward to this. Let's let's start though with your journey, which is an interesting one. As I was doing the research, you started your career as a TV reporter, and then I think your dad is a, a weatherman as well, right? He is over in the Utah Salt Lake market. Uh, so, so is that uh, kind of what drew you to that? Observing him, or what was the attraction to becoming a TV reporter in your early career? I, I just like the fact I could do something different every day. Um, just always wanted to learn all of those different things. Um, I, I love debate in high school uh, and even in the college, I, I debated on, on the college network. And so I just thought that interviews and asking questions was just a really fascinating uh, way to learn things. You must have been a, a curious, still are probably, but must have been a curious person even as a child, I suspect. I, I mean, I also was a super nerd. Uh, so like I was the kid that like walked around the neighborhood and collected bugs. Like I wanted to be an entomologist that oh, do see. bug wars and have praying mantises fighting black widows and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Super curious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it sounds better than being a nerd, but, but all that's good. And so then you did that. How long did, how long were you a reporter? Uh, it's about two and a half years. So okay. I did a, I did a stint for two years up in Idaho. Uh, I was the last reporter hired at my station, KIDK, before they went under and sold out to their competition. Oh boy! Uh, and the week I left, I'd already put my notice in, but the week I left, uh, they they laid off like half the staff. And then I went up to Wisconsin, uh, and that was a brutal, eye-opening experience. So I went from the most conservative county in the country, like oh Rexburg, Idaho. And then I moved to the most liberal county in the entire country, Madison, Wisconsin. God, I would not and, thought that was the place, but interesting. And that was a eye-opening uh, execution that I failed on. <laughs> Just quite frankly, like by week three, I knew I wanted to quit. Interesting. Like, like there's not very many times in my life where I did start doing something. And I'm like, yeah, this isn't for me. And and right around week three, I was doing a live weather hit, 
uh, ironically weather related, even though that wasn't like my, you know, my main beat and just, they, they throw reporters out into the blizzards and just, you know, to, to make people feel like they're glad they're home. Right. And, and so this blizzard hit worst thing that Wisconsin had experienced in 10 years, everybody saw them in their pajamas, uh, live, you know, camera guy gives me the note to go live. I couldn't even see him. Uh, so I didn't go live and I was staring at the camera for 30 extra seconds live on television which of course made the news director super happy <laughs> and my hair froze over. Oh my. Uh, I, just, I just felt like an idiot. I felt, you know, and I was like, okay, this is, I, this is not for me. Um, so I, at, that was the moment I decided I was going to switch careers. I didn't know what I was going to do yet, uh, but I knew it wasn't going to be a reporter in the middle of a blizzard. Yeah. And so you end up then going into marketing and, and, and that was a shift in your career. How did you end up in marketing then? So, so the moment I, you know, exited the reporter sphere and I was like, okay, I'm not going to work my way up that guild anymore. Uh, I went back to school uh, and I picked up an MBA and I had like an in-between job working at Western Governors University as an enrollment counselor. And, and that's when I fell in love with marketing because we were, you know, it was a nonprofit university. So it wasn't like one of those, you know, shady, like for-profit college jobs, but I got to market, you know, nurses and encourage them to go back to finish their, their bachelor's degrees. And in doing so, I, I discovered that there was just a lot of lack of follow-up email cadence and lack of follow-up in the entire system. And so I was like, well, I could fix this. And I created a, a use case and a case study. It ended up being my capstone project for my MBA as well. Um, uh, and, and I did that MBA in four months, by the way, uh, wow. which is kind of unusual because it's a competency-based model at Western Governors University. And so uh, I just took all the classes and I just passed the tests and handed my stuff in and, and it, you know, it went pretty fast. Yeah. So I did think, that. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Do you think the MBA, uh, are you, is it helping you now in your business? Do you think you're applying what you learned there? No. Um, I think the MBA opened up doors for me. I already knew the knowledge. That's how I passed through it in, in four quick months. Um, but, but basically uh, that, that opened up a lot of doors because I finished the degree. I finished that capstone project with like an improvement of reactivating old leads by like 33%. Um, and, and then somebody else was able to replicate my numbers. And so I ended up pitching the idea to a sister company called Straighter Line, um, college courses for 99 bucks out of Maryland subscription model style. And they, they picked me up and that was my oh, first see. real marketing job. Right. Right. Gave you that taste for, for it and that you could decipher how this works to some, to some level. All right. So what is, is, is Amazon, is my Amazon guy, the first business you started or did you have a business before that? I mean, I've always had like side hustle stuff. Like, uh, you know, growing up, I was teaching chess lessons and I had, uh, you know, 50 different elementary schools I'd visited during my chess teaching career and, you know, hundreds of students privately taught. Mm -hmm. um, so I sold, you know, back in the day, I was selling chess boards and chess pieces and all that fun stuff, like straight up entrepreneurship. So what's interesting, though, is that after I did, you know, straighter line, I ended up working for four failed startups, like back to back. Interesting. And, and, and every time I would end up getting like a 25% raise, but it was like six to nine month stints. And so like, uh, you know, a lot of people are like, Hey, your resume, it matters. You got to stay somewhere for two years, yada, yada. <laughs> if you want to be an entrepreneur that doesn't matter actually. No, it doesn't. Yeah. Did it, it did all those uh, failures that you observed Did it, it didn't scare you from saying, I don't want any part of that whole startup world or what were your thoughts? No, it actually drove me. I was like, these guys are idiots. Like, why are they doing <laughs> this? Like I worked for the British. I, I'll, I'll happily throw my former employers. Under the bus here. <laughs> um, I worked for the British. It was a company called the Nisbets, which was a $250 million restaurant equipment company for, for B2B over in the United Kingdom. They opened up a $5 million warehouse in Baltimore, Maryland, and then started sending non-Americanese edited catalogs, a, a la, come buy your rubbish bins from us Brits. <laughs> um, and and they, they just really had no freaking idea how big the United States was. And they thought they could just open up one warehouse in the East Coast and they'd be okay. And they'd just ship it across. And then all of a sudden they'd be printing money. Like that was their business model. Interesting. And they, and this $5 million warehouse they opened was ridiculous. Like, what were they thinking? And it was, it was obvious to me very, very quickly. And so, so I go in there and I, I grow their marketplaces and I'm like busting out my numbers, but there, the deficit was so great. They couldn't, they couldn't uh, sustain that model at all. Yeah. Yeah. Right, you mentioned, obviously you, you were a master chess instructor and I, I should have gathered that that was your first, your first entrepreneurial venture, but 
what I'm curious there, as I saw that in your, in your bio is what, what uh, do you think becoming at that level of a player and instructor at chess that you're able to apply to business? Well, I mean, you could take like the Queen's Gambit Netflix series and, and cross apply it to business very easily, right? Like what, what happened when Queen's Gambit came out is there was a super demand for chess sets. Like we're talking like an 800% increase. Is that right? I have not sustained. seen that show yet. My wife has watched it and she loved it, but I haven't watched it yet. It's pretty good, right? Like uh, as a chess player, I wanted them to show me more of the board positions and mm -hmm. I wanted to make fun of like, you know, what they were doing. <laughs> but but from a drama standpoint, it's it's decent. Like, I you know, I give it high props. Like, you know, IMDB scale 7.8, 7.9, somewhere around there. And, and, uh, you know, every time I watch chess things, like, like the first Harry Potter movie or something like that, it just, I want to pull my hair up because they're so <laughs> unrealistic scenarios. They make zero sense. So they're, they're dramatizations, if you will, but, but chess taught me to think ahead, right? Like you're looking at, okay, if I do this, how is the market going to respond? If I do this, how will my employees respond? Right. And, and I always joke that now that I run an agency, I've got 175 employees, as, as of time of this recording, it might be 200 by the time this goes live. We're hiring a crazy ton of people right now. And, and uh, I always joke that I don't run an agency. I run, a, I run an HR company at this point. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, the, this point of thinking ahead is such, such a big one. Uh, it's, an, it's interesting because I, I think that that as a business owner, that's often the superpower that we have to either have or develop. Because it is about trying to anticipate and read that crystal ball of what where we think is how, what we think is happening next. But also when we make a decision, we have to think a few steps ahead. And so I'm glad you shared that as a skill that, that you developed there, but it's so critical to business, in my opinion. All right. So then if I understood correctly, you kept getting asked by others to help consult with them on the side, on the expertise that you were developing with Amazon. But what was it that you were selling on Amazon that helped you develop that expertise? So because I worked for all those failed startups, um, like the VPs at these companies would be like, okay, the company sucked, but I liked working with Steven and they'd hire me for their, their next business or venture. And so it just snowballed at one point, you know, like I, I grew atmix.com's SEO traffic by 10 million uniques in one year. Like you could look it up in SEM rush or a Harris and, and like, you could see my hire date. It's so blatantly obvious. And they sustain that five, six, seven years later with the traffic increase I gave them. Um, and so like, I, I was able to demonstrate competency and competency attracts value and value attracts being paid money. Right. And so at that point um, I got, I get laid off from my latest startup venture company called lights online. So by progressive lighting in Georgia, and they, they, they had a business model where it was more of a retail model, not, a, not so much on the private label side, which was the mistake of their model. And they were trying to go from being a wholesaler to becoming a retailer. And that's like the difference between running a Costco where it's, it's uh, nice, neat pallets all in Costco and you ship them out nice, neat and clean versus a Kroger where it's clean up on aisle seven, like every freaking single day. And, and so like companies really struggle transitioning between business models. Like I don't generally recommend it. Sometimes you have to do it to survive, right? Otherwise you're going to have the Kodak moment. And, and then your business is over. Right. But many times, if you start a business and you create a core competency in one section, it doesn't translate to the next venture, a la wholesale to retail. So, so I get all these questions and, and, and I start working on it. I'm like, well, okay, so I've got enough you know, experience. Maybe I should do this for myself. So I start, you know, I'm like, okay, but the one thing I'm not is I'm not a product sourcer, right? Like, I don't know how to come up with the, the engineered product. I don't know how to make a patent. I can't like... Like my handwriting or my ability with my, my hands is like my giant weakness. <laughs> like I could type like a hundred words per minute, no joke, but my handwriting is so bad that like no, no teacher would pass me past third grade handwriting equivalent. Right. Oh so, so I don't know how to make product, but what I did know is I knew how to market product. Right. And so that's why I ended up creating an agency and, and, and marketing other people's products. Cause it was much, much more my cup of tea. I do side hustle and, and, you know, run a million dollar brand with funny wine glasses called Monster. And we just started an Age of Sage brand. I'm also starting a holster company. Um, and we have you know, probably a million dollar PO that's going to come in with a holster company in our first year, which is uh, spectacular. Uh, but, uh, you know, the reason I did that is because I was tired of making other people millions of dollars. And I was like, can I make myself millions of dollars? I see. And in the last couple of years, I've found out the answer is yes, it's possible. 
it's just a whole lot of damn work. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you have, this is classic situation. You know, I call it for myself, shiny object syndrome. How do you manage all of these different projects? I mean, you just, you shared with us that just with my Amazon guy, you're hiring like crazy. That That's a full-time endeavor. How do you manage shifting from one to the other and compartmentalizing that? So it's a really good question. <laughs> Let's break, I'll try and break it down. First thing I'll say is a lot of people are TGIF guys and they're like, oh, it's Friday. I can finally relax, right? Yeah. I'm a TGIM guy. <laughs> I love, love going to work. Like it's my cup of tea. I, 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 you know, my personal motto is live long and prosper, uh, which is obviously a total rip from Spock. I'm basically Spock. I'm super <laughs> introverted and highly logical. Not and the pointy so, ears though. You have, you have perfect <laughs> ears. Might as well. Yeah. Might as well. Might as well. Uh, yeah, I, I used to say, you know, I used to say prosperity in all things, but my wife made me rebrand it. She says Spock's <laughs> a little bit more lovable. Uh, so, um, and I've been doing a lot of rebranding of late just on how I manage or scale all of my operations. Um, so like we, as one small anecdote, we had a core value called impatience, which is obviously a negative uh, connotation. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I like hiring impatient people because they got stuff done. And I just rebranded that to eagerness. And now we have eager beaver memes running all over our Slack channels. So, love it. Love it. but, but this is a very complex question, right? Right. right Henry, like, how do we, how do we manage all these things? Science, shiny objects under hundred percent. Well, you have to get on base, right? If you can get on base with all of these different things, then effectively you're doing it correctly. But if you are just doing work for the sake of work and going through the motions that won't check out. And, and so each business has to run um, on its own merits and has to produce and it has to drive results. And that's what you mean by get on base? Correct. Right. So, so, the, so agencies are always highly profitable endeavors um, and they don't have a lot of like liability issues, right? right. You don't have to go buy product. You don't have to sit millions of dollars in product or, or buy infrastructure. And my business is completely remote. So it's a cash cow. Yeah. The reason people don't like running agencies is because it's, you know, you take that retail model of cleanup aisle seven and exasperate that another tenfold because clients are needy. They want results yesterday and you have to have highly detail oriented staff that deliver accurate work at high quality 24 seven. And if you don't, you get to hear about it nonstop. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that was probably key though, is finding, um, finding partners. Like I'm not a really good partner builder. Uh, and so in the case of my product business, though, I have a glaring weakness, right? I, I don't know how to source. I don't know how to, I don't know how to build a product from scratch. That's not my cup. So I had to find uh, a partner and, and one of my partners, uh, you know, his name is Nick Nido and, and he has a, a degree from MIT and he's a master's in engineering and the dude is just bored, right? He just, he, and, and so like you marry a bored guy who can make stuff with a guy who's got more drive than 99% of the world. That's me. Yeah. Uh, and, and shit gets done, man. It just happens. <laughs> so. I love it. I love it. Excellent. Yeah. We, and I can talk about that for another hour, but let's, let's, let's segue into it. And thanks for sharing all that. So such inspirational stuff on your journey. Um, but let's dive into selling on Amazon and where I'd like to start at the highest level is with the question of who should consider selling on Amazon. I know that's a broad question, but what I'm getting at is, is there uh, in your opinion, types of products, or types of businesses that are a better fit for selling on Amazon? Absolutely. B2C is where it's at. Um, the, the real key here is I, I, I predict that American made manufacturing is going to see a really big push in the next decade. It's, it's too early right now, but there's going to come a breaking point with the geopolitics. So I think, you know, American made is going to come back, but here's the problem. Uh, there's no real B2C manufacturing infrastructure in the States. They all went B2B. I joined the Georgia Manufacturing Alliance trying to crack this nut. And what I learned is that like, there's no B2C manufacturing in the States, like at all, right? Like there is, but like, we're talking like 1% of what it needs to be. Mm -hmm. And are you, uh, is it, is it the manufacturing or is it the logistics and distribution component that's not there? Or is it both? Oh, I think the logistics is fine. Okay. Um, we have a really, I mean, like think about like the size of the United States, like how, mm. we, how, how does Amazon prime work? Like just, oh my gosh, like you can get stuff in two days and, and right. two days wasn't fast. It works because I can, I can leverage a platform like Amazon for yeah. logistics and distribution. Got it. But, yeah, but yeah. the manufacturers want to do, or for whatever reason, combination of reasons, 
are focused on B2B is what you're telling me. Yeah. So just as one example, I, I, I went and toured all these manufacturing plants and, and, I, and I went into one and, and they make toilet seats, but not just any kinds of toilet seats, Henry, right? Like they were the kind that are used on airplanes and they were super fire retardant. And, and so like, these are like $400 toilet seats and they make them in mass. And so I, I got to watch how they make these cool plastic toilet seats. And it's just, you know, kind of interesting, but if they had tried to make a B2C product, and try and sell a toilet seat, they'd be looking at, you know, 20 bucks on Amazon. And that yeah. model, obviously, very different. Right. So, so what kind of projects, products do well on Amazon? Um, I love the gift category. That's like my favorite. Um, you know, supplements is the hardest category to sell in. The Everybody, gift category, you said? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. so, if it's, so if it's giftable and it brings joy, uh, I, like, I like that category in general. Okay. Okay. That could be home goods. That could be kitchen. That could be, I mean, it's very generic crossover into many, many subcategories. Um, I think there's some categories that are underdeveloped. Um, I would say sports and outdoors um, is rather underdeveloped. I think tools is going to see some additional development this next year. Uh, but, but things like uh, selling widgets, um, you know, your commodity items, there's, it's really difficult to do that, right? So if you're trying to sell like the apple slicers of the world, uh, good luck. You're, you're competing against guys that already have 10,000 reviews. Okay. All right. So you're, you're trying to find that that niche that's underserved, so classic stuff here, right? It's a niche that's underserved that I'm not competing against people that have already established or it's ubiquitous. And so it's needle and haystack for people to find me. I, I like to say it's never been a better time to sell on Amazon. If you're not on Amazon, you're irrelevant if you're a B2C product. But I also say it's never been harder to sell on Amazon. And obviously I'm biased. That's why my Amazon guy exists, right? We service that need. But, but the reason for that is interesting, right? So you got the Chinese that are selling direct to consumer for the first time, hitting you from the right. And then on the left, you have Amazon aggregators, which are just money bag dudes with $13 billion that entered the space in the last 12 months. They're coming in and jacking up the competition. So lower prices on the right because of the Chinese going direct to consumer, higher competition from the left from you know, the US venture capitalists. And then on, the, on top of that, you have Amazon's policies raising the bar, like Amazon is entering its maturity phase right now. So you got pressure coming down on you from Amazon itself. You know, just one, one example, just last week, they started requiring, you know, radio frequency documentation. And, you know, like if you have a Bluetooth product or something, it's crazy. And so a lot of people have to go and find all the policy docs and fill that out. So, so it's a lot to navigate right now. Um, and so if you're an entrepreneur listening to this and wondering if you should sell on Amazon, the first thing I would say to you is make sure you side hustle this for 12 months and make sure you have five or $10,000 that you could literally just throw in the garbage and never see again and still live your life and continue without losing your shirt and still being able to pay rent. If you can't do that, Amazon's not right for you. That money is just be, because of the trial and error effort to, to finally find your spot, your niche in Amazon, or where, where is that money going? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good point, Henry, because like you have to pay your tax on Amazon, right? There's no college degree for Amazon. Like you can't even find an e-commerce degree at 85% of the universities. And even if you could find an e-commerce degree, the guy teaching it hasn't sold e-commerce or doesn't have the experience to teach it to begin with. So at the end of the day, this is a brand new vertical. Um, I estimate there's 50,000 jobs that are going to be created in the e-commerce space, specifically in Amazon over the next two years because of the lack of, of personnel available. Um, and so this is why like interns are 10% of my payroll going up. It's probably gonna be more like 15% by next month. We are investing in the next crop of people because they're so hard to find right you, now. You are, you're having to grow them yourself. You're having to develop I, Yeah, them I have yourself. to train them myself. Yep. And, and so luckily we have really good SOPs and, and we've created a, a, a really good culture. And, and like my Slack channel feels like Reddit right now because of how many memes get posted and people are just like all in. Right. Like, because at the end of the day, working at an agency is very stressful, massive amount of chaos. So is Amazon. If you're an entrepreneur, if you sell on Amazon, it's like massive chaos. And there's no playbook to tell you how to get through your day, let alone the week, let alone the month, et cetera. And so you have to go from one thing to the next, one fire from one fire to the next. Yeah, it's a moving target, right? I mean, it, 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 it's at a whole nother level. In business as it is, it has changed so much. You know, in the, in the olden days, if we will, I opened my shop on Main Street and things pretty much stayed the same for a long time. Now on these platforms, it's, you know, daily, if not hourly, and I have to be aware of what's changing. Yeah, I mean, like the Chinese are playing super dirty. They're hijacking your listings and becoming unauthorized sellers and selling counterfeit goods. And it's like, 
yeah, mom and pop seller on Main Street never had to deal with that bull crap. Yeah. The worst thing they had to deal with was like a Walmart opening up in there. Right. City, yeah. Which All right, was so, bad at the time, but not even yeah. comparable now. Doesn't compare. All right. So so on this focus on selling, if I if I did the research correctly, there's two major categories or areas that I'd like to get a little bit more detail on from you or insights. One is increasing traffic is one area you focus on and then improving conversion. Seems pretty obvious, but but that's where, that's where it is. Once you get on there and find your niche and you find the right product. So let's start with increasing traffic. I was hoping we could start with PPC, which is a pay-per-click. Um, I really have no experience whatsoever on the Amazon platform with pay-per-click, but I suspect it works similar to what I'm doing on Google with pay-per-click there, or educate me on that at a high level if you would. Yeah, high level theory, they're comparable, but the tactical is totally different, right? So in Google, you just have massive segmentation. Google's got 10 years on top of Amazon. They're, they're that far ahead. But here's the thing, like three, four years ago, uh, people started their product searches on Google. And today, more than 60% of people start their product searches on Amazon. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's, you know, it's really interesting to see that development. PPC cost on Amazon went up 35% last year, wow. you know, very much has a lot to do with the Amazon aggregators dumping a ton of money in the space. But there's just I mean, a because lot of it is still an auction type uh, system. And so that's what why that drove the price up in part. Yeah, there's there's a lot more people competing because because if you think about it, like what's the fastest way to deploy cash into a business, mm -hmm. right? It's it's advertising yeah. every single time. It's the fastest way to get your best results is advertising. Now that's not necessarily the best choice. It's just the fastest, right? And so all of these aggregators are dumping in billion, like literally, I'm I'm like not exaggerating, thirteen billion dollars. I, I actually wrote it all out when I typed you know, try to total it up for the last 16 months uh, and made a website called Amazon aggregators.com, just kind of like a special pet project. And I interviewed 40 aggregators. I, I brought many on my podcast to talk to them. Um, and it's, it's really interesting to see how that kind of develops out. Um, so it's going to be good for the space in many ways, but there are some challenges, right? Like uh, it means that higher, higher competition. So, so PPC uh, at, at the end of the day, your job as a marketer is to sell more products, to more people more often. And this is the one that everybody forgets for more money mm -hmm. with inflation rates just skyrocketing right now and P PPC costs going up, logistics costs going up. Like you could buy a container out of China for four grand, 40 foot container four years ago. Today, it's like, you know, $26,000 is yeah, what I paid crazy. last fall. And, and so like all of these things, and the government says the inflation rate 7.1%. So just, you know, just times that by three and that's actual the real inflation rate uh, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. And, and on Amazon, you can feel it just like you just you just see it, you just know it, you, you're, you're living it, right? Uh, and so my, my best advice to run a PPC strategy is to optimize and segment out as much as you possibly can, because you can hit your consumer from so many different angles, uh, and, and most of them are keyword-based in the Amazon platform. And if you don't segment out your ads or you don't have a resource managing that, you're going you're gonna to falter. Yeah. You know, if you want to be a million dollar brand on Amazon, you need to spend $140,000 this next year on ads specifically. That's that's no investment in SEO, that's no investment in design or anything. That's just pure ad spent. 14%. That's where you need to be. And, and because people are more and more searching on Amazon, do I also need to have a Google campaign running? I think so in the future, but right now, not necessarily. Okay. Um, so as one, one example, I launched a product. It was a mom box uh, under Age of Sage brand. And, and, you know, this mom box was a $50 gift set kit for moms. Came with a card, came with a wine tumbler, uh, the bath bombs, the mom soaps, the full nine yards, right? I launched this product three weeks before Mother's Day last year. I generated $144,000 in revenue in, in that three weeks with only $11,000 in PPC spent. Wow. And- and the reason that worked is because, and by the way, 5,000 of that keyword spend was on one keyword, broad match, uh, gifts for mom. And I was able to index that product for SEO with more than 3,500 keywords in under two weeks. And, and, and the, the vertical that I work in, you know, you, you started talking about like how traffic and conversion sounds basic, right? Well, the theory is basic, but the execution is complex. And, and so a lot of people, you know, they're like, oh, that's too much work. I don't want to do that. I'd rather just go spend money and buy rebates and pay my customers to give me reviews. 
totally prohibited by the way, but that's what, that's what the space did. Yeah. And so, so as an agency, obviously that's not a sustainable model. So I had to get back to the basics and just execute them so freaking well, nobody could compete with it. And that's what I did, right? Like uh, I'll give you one or two examples and we're kind of pivoting it over to, to the SEO traffic sure, yeah, generation right. part. Yeah. Um, but like A plus content, which is the nice, beautiful images that you see below the fold on Amazon. Uh, I can, I, I'm an, I'm an industry uh, leader. When I talk about SEO, I'm a thought leader. I'm the first to market on these topics. I had to convince the market that A plus content is indexed and they resisted me on this. And they're like, but I'm like, no, seriously, SEO is more important than design. You have to have 500 words of copy in your A plus content. And if you don't do that, you're going to have less traffic. And everybody's this, like, this definition what? of A plus content, is this your definition? Is that what you call it? And it's called A plus content or enhanced brand content. That's the got Amazon it, label. Got it. Got it. Okay, and, and this shows below the folds um, mm -hmm. in the product description section. Yeah. And you've got a bunch of examples on your website of what that might yes. look like. But I'm sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Continue. Yeah. And, and so, you know, here's for, for those that are already Amazon sellers, if this is news to you and you don't want to believe what I'm saying, here's your take home test. Go take one photo of your enhanced brand content, put in. Uh, some Spanish keywords behind the alt text of one photo. And within 48 hours, it will index. This is a easily retraceable, provable mechanism that proves me correct that A plus content is indexed. Well, if that's true, what does that mean? It means you need 500 words of copy in your enhanced brand content. And all of the big corporations are doing the opposite. They're making no text A plus content and they're doing nice, pleasing, aesthetic looking listings. Well, the entrepreneur knows you don't follow the big guys, you follow the results a la competency. And so the results say, this is what you need to do. But, but sometimes industries, they resist change and they, they're like, oh, that's foreign. Give sure. you one more example. Or they're applying uh, methodologies or you know what was previously proven branding approaches or marketing approaches that- From another trans platform. Yeah, from another yep. platform, yeah. Yeah, that that's tends to be what happens. Um, one more example, there's a search term field inside of Seller Central. That's the platform used to sell on Amazon. And uh, people were putting characters in there and counting characters instead of counting mm -hmm. bytes. I just, I just watched that video you, you put together on it. Every single SEO tool on the market is wrong. Wrongly counting characters. They're counting spaces is what it translates to. And that means there's 20% more SEO juice available in the platform. It's an incredible miss by the entire freaking industry. And, and I, my team has been doing it for over a year. Um, and when I find like, sometimes I go heads down as an agency. I don't really pay attention to what everybody else is doing, which sure. is real true thought leadership. And so when I, when, I, when I became aware that everybody else was counting it wrong, I went out and like, I took screenshots of every single SEO tool I could get my hands on, Helium 10, Jungle Scout, Zonguru, you know, many, many others. Every single one of them was, was incorrect, all of them. And so like, I feel like a black swan sometimes <laughs> where I'm out there like <laughs> saying like, Hey, you guys are all stupid. You're all wrong. Follow me. Right. And everybody's like, yeah, you're the black swan. We're going to go hang out with the white swans. Right. <laughs> like that's what, that's kind of what I feels like sometimes, but, yeah. but that's true thought leadership. Um, you know, and, and I'll be the, I'll be the guy in the room that says like the opposite of what everybody else is saying. And then I'll prove it. And I'll be like, here's the scientific method. You can replicate it yourself. Go have at it. And, and this particular breaking news is so weird and blatantly odd because the, the Amazon help files actually back me up on this one, right? So like on the A plus content, you had to go test it yourself to find out there wasn't any Amazon help files, but on the search term field, the Amazon help files totally back me up and they literally say by it's not characters. And so, uh, you know, some SEO tools are starting to make the changes. This news is only like two weeks old. And so like, you know, Zonguru had it patched within 48 hours, props to them. Uh, but that's, that's kind of, you know, to kind of finish out the SEO side or the traffic side, you, you, you have to invest in things. It's not set it and forget it. It's continual optimization. Absolutely. We run, yeah. we run multiple phases of SEO. You got to index, then you got to incrementally index. Then you got to go for the strike zone keywords that are in rank 20 through 50, try and push them up to rank one through 10. Got to do all those things. Okay. Your, your website is laid out very easy to follow. So I encourage uh, for anybody listening that wants and, and needs more detail, again, to summarize that the key, the two key functional areas, maybe that's not the right term, but the two key areas to successfully selling on Amazon is increasing traffic and improving conversions. Obvious enough, but under that increasing traffic, we touched on PPC, the importance of that SEO and how it applies and, 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 and specifically 
this l latest bit of information, which is so powerful on characters versus bytes. Then in improving conversions, you touched on it. A lot of it is about design and, and very special or specialized practices on achieving listing optimization, as, as it's called. So those at a high level are the focus areas. And what I love about your website is on each of those sections, I think for each of them, you have a video that goes into more detail on all of them. So that's great content. On my YouTube channel, more than 900 videos of content. We give all of our trade secrets away for free. Yeah, it's, it's all there. All right, so let's start to summarize it. If I'm considering selling a product on Amazon, where do you suggest I get started? Well, the first thing is you got to have to have product in hand to get going. And so a lot of people are like, okay, what's the business model? Right. So, you know, back in the day, people did retail arbitrage. They'd go to Toys R Us, buy the, buy the, you know, stuff on discount and sell it. Then they upgraded the wholesale and they would go look up wholesalers and sell their product on Amazon. Then the wholesalers got smart and realized that all the retailers were messing up their Amazon pages and they went direct to consumer themselves. So that's out too. So then people are like, okay, well, I got a private label. And this is when you take, uh, you know, an item and try and make it a little bit better or slap your own brand on it. This is the model that's currently the best thing to do. Um, and there's to, two to types white of label a product as seeds yes. to start with. Yeah. Correct. Or maybe so, a somewhat custom quote unquote formulation of something. Yeah. 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 Make an improvement, right? Like, uh, you know, you, you said formulation. So add an ingredient to your supplement, mix them right. up a little bit. Right. Um, or, or, you know, you're selling bamboo sticks and all the markets got 16 inches and you come out with a 24 inch version, right? Yeah. Um, those are all kinds of different things you could do uh, to, to improve upon it. But you're, you're looking at a me too lookalike product where you're trying to optimize and improve upon. The harder products, you know, is the demand gen product. And this is like sliced bread before everybody knows what's, what sliced bread is. It's the type sort of product you need like a Billy Mays to come in here and sham wow you, mm -hmm. right? Like, like, uh, and you need video content to show it. If you have a sham wow product, a, a demand generation product, you have to do so much investment into marketing to tell the consumers that you solve a problem that they didn't even know existed. Yeah. And, and so 90% of Amazon sellers are selling a me too product. Okay. It's just an improved slight variation. 10% of sellers though, are going to be selling the first to market demand gen products. And those are much harder and, and you, you might have a patent, you might have to do something. Um, but for those that do that, they're, they're going to make 100 times the profit. Sure, sure. But that's not, I, you know, unless you are convinced your invention that you've gotten patented is, is the next sliced bread, you got to be, go into it eyes wide open that it's going to be a significant investment. Because, so most people, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, you, uh, so most people are, are, are buying product from China and shipping it over, right? Yep. Um, and I think that model will die in the next five years. I think, okay. I think we're going to see a resurgence of you know, manufacturing in the States. And I strongly encourage everybody to get on that bandwagon. It's definitely a personal project to my heart that I think we need to get American manufacturing back. Um, but, but in any case, um, you, gotta, you have to have a product to sell some way, somehow. Yeah. And then you got to open up a Seller Central account. Uh, and then you're going to, you're going to load the product and manage your catalog and, and merchandise it and drive the traffic and try and improve the conversion rates and run AB tests and all that fun jazz, but it's not passive income. So if you're looking for a passive income business, Amazon is not that. <laughs> and it's not because every, all of the reasons and many more that we've talked about where it's continuous improvement, it's continuous shifting and adjusting your marketing efforts on that platform. You got it. And, and you, you have to think about, um, you know, like one of my favorite spirit animals is the hummingbird, right? Like it's constantly iterating. It's constantly moving. It's going to get the nectar out of that flower. It might not be very much nectar, but it's going to hit a hundred flowers today, mm -hmm. right? That's the sort of thing methodology that I think works with Amazon. The yeah. measure once, measure twice, cut once, definitely not the correct methodology for Amazon. So if you're a craftsman and you like to be methodical, you bet buckle up. Uh, you better you better come with a marketer who can iterate because if you don't, you're going to be dead on arrival. I could be listening to this and think, well, I, I think Stephen is is telling me Amazon the opportunities on Amazon have passed. I, I don't think that's what you're saying. But what do you say to that? Do you are you still bullish and you still recommend that people take advantage of this incredible platform to sell something? I'm incredibly bullish. I think it's never been a better time to sell on Amazon. But what I am is realistic. And I, you know, I, I, I like to criticize 
you know, the, the ninja hacks and the people that are like, yeah, sign up for my course here on, and, and they're, they're, they're doing their YouTube videos and showing off their Mercedes Benz. And they're like, yeah, it's passive income. Just, yeah, you know, no. Hey, mom's you, you, out you, there. You, you can only, you can only imagine how many proposals like that I get to come on this show. Right. And that's why I haven't touched on this subject very often, but but yes, yeah, like right. uh, my my wife, Emily, we have, we have four kids, six and under, all right? Like live long and prosper in every way, right? Not just in business, but in family too. And and she gets targeted advertising all the time. Hey, run your business during nap time. And we think it's the whole, most hilarious thing ever. <laughs> and they're, they're, they're taking money from people that should not be entrepreneurs. So it takes a massive amount of work. Like, like if, you know, one person asked, uh, it, it was probably Gary Vee, they asked him, he's like, hey, what? What's something you would tell uh, an entrepreneur to uh, that they that they need to hear, and and it was something along the lines of if they need um, some inspirational quote, then don't be an entrepreneur, right? Like like yeah, it's right. If you can't find your own inspiration, then maybe that's what you need to focus on is what why. Yeah, your your why is the only thing that's going to get you up in the day um, to go out and do what you do. If you don't have a why, then don't do the what. Well said. Well said. All right. Uh, we've been touching on it, but summarize for me briefly the services that you offer and, and who is who is an ideal client for you. So we we help people launch or build upon their Amazon brands, specifically through Seller Central on Amazon. We do everything we can to grow traffic and improve conversion rates through PPC, SEO, design and catalog management. We're a full service uh, marketing agency and we'll we'll take care of Amazon so you have peace of mind so that you could focus on your business while we take care of Amazon. And is it at a price point that is starting out uh, might make sense for me? You know, we don't release our pricing um, because every situation is different number of products, how complex the category is. But at the end of the day, um, you know, a strike zone client that will easily happily pay us, they're, they're generally making 50K a month already on Amazon. Okay. But there's many entrepreneurs out there that have capital and they want to invest and they're okay with not seeing a return on their investment for six, eight, 12 months. Um, and they want to start with this from scratch, we'll happily launch them all, okay. all day long. Fair enough. And then tell us about the, the, um, the SOP on S SEO uh, offer. Yeah, so you guys heard me talk about search engine optimization today. Uh, if you found that curious, we have uh, a free guide on how to do SEO by yourself without paying me anything. Um, and it's it's straight on my website. Henry will add it to the, the show notes. So you guys can check that out. Absolutely. Thanks for that. And then, you know, I'm always looking for a book recommendation. We, we chatted about several ones that you've got on your desk, but is there a book that you would recommend? If you want to be an entrepreneur at scale, like you want to go past four employees, you want to go past 10 employees, you, you have to read Traction. Like it, there is no better book on how to build a system at scale than the Traction book. I'm also a big believer in Culture Index, which marries straight into the Traction system, right people, right seat. Uh, and, and, you know, us with 175 employees at my Amazon guy, if, if I hadn't have understood the principles taught in traction, there was no way I'd have gotten past 40 employees. Like no way. Yeah. Excellent. All right. A, a couple minutes here. I, I just want to explore a little bit further your thoughts on where Amazon is going. It's such a, a curious thing, obviously, because they've, they've disrupted so many industries, certainly the retail industry. Where, where do you think it's going? And, and one of the things that perplexes me is that it seems like as they continue to build these physical warehouses where there is stuff inventoried, and I get it, it's so that I, it can get it to the consumer faster and we want that as consumers. Vertical control. Yeah, but, but it seems to me like it's uh, one of the things that it, that it initially had disrupted was this need to have physical inventory at 10,000 retail locations and the inefficiencies of that. By building all these warehouses, aren't we... Aren't they going back towards that model? Educate me on what I'm missing there. Well, I mean, the warehouses are gigantic. For they are, all, yeah. I've toured right? one. It's you know, I mean, you were talking million, two million square foot warehouses. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're just absolutely behemoths. And you know, I, I think that nobody can touch Amazon because they built so much vertical control. I mean, this the same thing has happened time and time again over hundreds of years of, of entrepreneurship, you can see this, like even the railroad industry is a total comparable event here. Uh, everybody just buys everything up and then they gain vertical control. And then you, so like Amazon's buying boats right now. Like they're- Now, they're, now in some industries, that's become what we call a monopoly and that's been broken up, right? 
It is. It, I mean, it's straight up monopoly for sure. Right. And you see uh, Washington state going to bat with Bezos right now and, and much of Amazon. Um, I, I'll be honest. I think the government's in bed with, with Amazon. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, those little Alexa devices and uh, are in everybody's houses and the CIA <laughs> loves the AWS platform for those very reasons. So, so you I don't, don't have one Amazon, of those in your house. I'm gathering. I, I, I do, but I keep what it in the do? kitchen only, you know, Got no it. bedroom. Yeah. Right. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, there's nothing that's going to happen to take Amazon out in the next 10 years, like no chance of it happening. Walmart was the best shot and they failed. Uh, their infrastructure is good, but their scalability in, in technical internet e-commerce is terrible. Absolutely terrible. They bought Jet and they couldn't figure, figure out how to integrate it. I don't know if any of you guys have, have gone to a Walmart grocery pickup, but the experience is also awful, terrible, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Like I don't even want to do it. You go to Target, however, it's amazing. It's instantaneous. It's like the Chick-fil-A model, with the, you know, my pleasure type of angle, right? And so if anybody's going to catch Amazon, it's going to be a Target model, in my opinion. It ain't going to be Walmart, and Walmart's the closest with the most infrastructure. And that's interesting. And it makes sense because if you know a little bit about Target, you know they've focused on technology and big data, and, and that's been what's driven how they operate for quite some time, right? One of my favorite uh, stories about Target is that they can tell somebody's pregnant before they're yeah you know, they, 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 know got, they're they got in trouble on that right. <laughs> <laughs> There's an amazing story you guys should look up. I think Forbes did it or something, but yeah. Uh, and, and so like what they did to solve the problem because like the the you know the the, the tween mom the 16 year old uh, mom was getting <laughs> magazines about you know Pampers and and other things and and the parents were just like freaking so pissed off and yelling and. <laughs> And, and they didn't know their daughter was pregnant, but Target knew Target <laughs> So knew. based yeah. on buying habits on the credit card. And, and they're going to continue knowing. So that's, that's yeah. the thing. And so they know, so what they, they, know, they know how to apply that intelligence then to make their business better. Yeah. Yeah. So what they ended up doing was, is they'd put like a John Deere on page, you know, eight to the right and then put the pregnancy <laughs> stuff on page seven right next to it. So it wasn't as obvious. <laughs> it wasn't as blatant. <laughs> but yeah, Target uh, has the tech. No doubt. Absolutely. Absolutely. As does Amazon. Excellent stuff. Thank you for sharing. So what's one thing, Stephen, that you want us to take away from this conversation on selling on Amazon? Get on base. It, it, like you could talk about things all day long, but if you don't actually swing the bat and moneyball it, Brad Pitt style, be the, you know, be the athletics and look at the data and make competent decisions. What does it take to get on base? Not how pretty does it look? Not how good does it make you feel? Can you get on base? Go do something that's going to generate sales and income and hit your bottom line. And listen, I, I, that's great advice. And I think it applies to any kind of business. We can talk about it and plan for it and analyze it. You actually have to take action in as small a first iteration as possible so that you put, a, you know, you don't put everything at risk. But until you get in the instance of the game, you, you're not going to make any progress, obviously. That's exactly right. Tell me again where you want to go, where you want us to go rather to learn more. Uh, I think, you know, you should watch some of my videos on youtube.com slash my Amazon guy. I think that's the best way to do research and, and, and that's where I build my community. But if you guys have a question, you like the podcast, just want to say, hey, I thought this was one of the best podcasts on Henry's podcast. Send an email over to podcast at my Amazon guy.com. Love to hear from you. Excellent. We'll have a link to that on the show notes page for this episode as well. All right. Great conversation, Stephen. I could go on for another hour, but I want to respect your time and uh, we'll bring it to an end here. Thanks so much for being with me today and with sharing and answering all of these questions. I appreciate it. My pleasure. You're a great interviewer, Henry. Thank you. Thanks for that. This is Henry Lopez, and thanks for joining me on this episode of The How of Business. My guest today again was Stephen Pope. I release new episodes every Monday morning, and you can find me anywhere you listen to, uh, to podcasts including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and at my website, thehowofbusiness.com. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to The How of Business. For more information about our coaching programs, online courses, show notes pages, links, and other resources, please visit thehowofbusiness.com.